Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Gazing out your window, you spy an escaped farm turkey who has made your treasured flower bed into its favorite bathroom. You ask yourself, when I see the turkey, does it merely come into my mind's eye as the mere image of a bulbous feathered mass? Or am I directly accessing the bird somehow? Or is it the case that beyond the purview of this ruffled squatter, there exists an object which escapes perception? The thing in itself, the turkey in itself, perhaps. But in either case, we are left with the question of, is there something which exists outside of the reach of our sense? And is it possible that we can know that thing? On today's episode, we are visited by world-renowned phenomenologist Matt Bauer, whose philosophical exploits go far beyond journal articles, like the one on Kant and Husserl that we're about to discuss today. He is actually a practical phenomenologist of sorts, an alterer of perceptions, who moonlights as one of Theory Twitter's preeminent meme lords. Someone who has not only forced me to up my own meme game, but also someone who joins us today to indulge some classic approaches to theories of perception and knowledge. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thanks, Greg. All right. Are you willing to own up to any of what I just said about memes? Uh, am I the meme lord? Uh, well, we, we definitely vibe with the um, Leviathan posting. Absolutely. You and I and will. <laughs> well, we're not here to speak with us. Yeah. It all checks out with me, what you say. Great. Well, tell us a little bit about your work, um, what your research area is, and what brought you to write this particular paper. Yeah, so I'll, I'll only rewind as far as grad school. Um, I got working um, on my dissertation project on Edmund Husserl's phenomenology, and the area that I was working in at that point was primarily the later Husserl, and I was doing what so many Husserl scholars do, uh, getting lost in the manuscripts, the many, many, many volumes of the Husserliana series. And uh, the one that my dissertation focused on is a, a set of texts closely related to what Husserl was doing in the Crisis of European Sciences and Transcendental Phenomenology, this, this later work. Um, and the volume, in fact, that I spent most of my time digging into, uh, it's, it's called um, uh, the, the Life World or the Lebensbelt uh, Manuscripts. And the dissertation project was um, actually not too far afield from the topic that we're going to talk about today. Um, one of Husserl's signature ideas is of the horizon of experience. Um, and also one of the late innovations in Husserl's uh, methodology is the development of a genetic phenomenology that has a kind of quasi-historical, at least dynamic and diachronic character to it. Um, and one of the interesting things I found pouring through these manuscripts is that Husserl says the horizon itself, which I think many kind of by default take to be a kind of essential a priori attribute of experience that like there just is no experience without it but yet you find Husserl in these later manuscripts saying actually there's a a, a story of the genesis of the horizon itself uh, and not only that but uh, a related notion that um, he throws around a lot in the crisis and works like that the world horizon uh, has a kind of genesis to it so the dissertation is trying to spell out how that story works um, post dissertation I took a kind of significant turn and I started reading work in analytic philosophy of perception. Maybe um, Alva Noe's action and perception was the thing that most impacted me at that point, um, where I started seeing, hey, all of these analytic philosophers talking about perception, Noe happens to be inspired by phenomenology. But I started recognizing all these affinities and interesting points of contact. Um, and so I, I spent probably the next decade uh, trying to find ways to um, bring Husserl into conversation with these people in a more analytic mode and to bring the philosophers of perception into conversation with Husserl in a more phenomenological mode. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's, that's been the bulk of, uh, what my work, uh, has been up to. Um, I've, I've kind of steadily, but slowly continued working on the idea of genetic phenomenology, uh, and publishing works, trying to explain what the method is. Uh, what some problems uh, potentially that, that face developing the method uh, are um, and whatnot. And occasionally you'll find me in some of my writings on philosophy of perception and phenomenology, 
engaging not just with who's Searle, uh, although that's my, my main uh, expertise, but talking about Levinas uh, and Merleau-Ponty. Um, I've kind of left Levinas behind, but um, the one thing that I did write centering on Levinas was trying to call attention to his philosophy of perception. Uh, it's, it's of the things that you will know about Levinas, probably the last one is what he says about sensory experience, but he says really interesting stuff and stuff that in, interesting in its own right, but also interesting within the phenomenological movement. He really bucks against what Husserl has to say about perception. Um, and uh, in certain moods, uh, I'm very uh, inspired by what Levinas has to say and attracted to it. But Yeah, maybe we can take a quick tangent because you bring up something that's um, you know on the minds of everybody in philosophy and on Twitter these days, which is the continental analytic divide, especially with respect to theory of perception and knowledge. When I was taught Husserl for the second time in grad school, um, it was in the context of a course with predominantly analytic philosophers, Gilbert Harmon, Frank Jackson, and, and all those folks. But I was taught at that time that the early Husserl was actually stolen by John Searle and then input into the analytic tradition and just kind of like reworked. Um, but I, I'm just curious, generally speaking, like talking about points of contact between continental and analytic philosophy, do you see there being a good reason for somebody who's involved in phenomenology if they are in the continental tradition to engage with analytic philosophy and vice versa? Um, that, uh, that is a great question. And like, be, before I directly answer it, I want to give a little anecdote. It was, it was my first year of grad school. And I remember one of the most impactful professors that I was working with, I remember him casually throwing out there the remark that, uh, Husserl is basically an analytic philosopher and they can have him. Uh, this is a Levinasian Hegelian guy. Um, but do I think it is worth it for phenomenologists to engage with analytic philosophy? Well, I'll tell you from a kind of like pragmatic point of view, um, I think like Husserlians tend to be on the defensive, uh, uh, that there doesn't tend to be a lot of interest in Husserl in his own right. And so if you kind of want to engage with a broader philosophical audience, it, the, the conversation always has to be Husserl and uh, and at least, at least when it comes to Husserl, uh, and, and to an extent, uh, Merleau-Ponty and Heidegger too, uh, at least in the English speaking world, the, uh, the phenomenology and has very often been phenomenology and philosophy of mind, phenomenology and cognitive science. So in, in a pragmatic way, it's good to engage with analytic philosophy because that's just already the direction the conversation has taken for 30 or 40 years. And if you want to be able to engage with the people who've been talking about Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, and Husserl in the English-speaking world, um, you're not going to know what they're up to if you're not familiar with some of the conversations in um, analytic philosophy of mind, philosophy of perception, philosophy of cognitive science. So there's, there's kind of a pragmatic reason to do it. Um, I... Uh, you know, I, I have different moods about uh, how I feel about the value of engaging with that literature. I think um, that there's a potential, um, there, there's a potential cost, uh, if you want to speak to an analytic audience, of to be heard out, I feel like you have to adopt um, a lot of the, the tropes and techniques and methods of analytic philosophy. And I think, I think that that can often require like putting to the side um, the methodological commitments that of, of the sources that you're working with. So like, I think very often if you read something by a Husserlian or a Heideggerian um, trying to engage with analytic philosophy of mind, um, you find them talking about commitments and ideas and concepts that come from phenomenologists, but I think that you rarely find them like doing phenomenology in the style of phenomenology. Um, they talk about uh, phenomenological concepts and ideas in an analytic mode. Um, and uh, this is something I've, I've done plenty too, not being totally, totally self-aware that to engage in a certain conversation, you, you kind of have to adapt and pick up the, the lingo and the, the style of discourse. Uh, but yeah. I, I, th I think there are ways to do it without being so concessive. Mm. 
Fair enough. Okay. Well, today we're going to try to wrap our heads around uh, one of the, the biggest concepts in the history of philosophy, which is the thing in itself. And your paper sets up this intriguing contrast between the way that Kant, the originator of this idea, handles it, and then Husserl picks it up later. Um, we also have Adam on board, resident Kant explainer, who's going to uh, be in the discussion. I'll be playing the role of like, you know, the 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 neophyte who who really hasn't dealt with phenomenology too much and kind of pushing back against this. But maybe the first thing that we ought to do is let's talk about Kant. What is the thing in itself? What are the general contours of this concept? And um, what what did Kant mean by it? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the notion of the thing in itself comes uh, initially out of the uh, the critique of pure reason, uh, one of Kant's first major breakout, like mature works. Um, and uh, to give a little bit of the context of like like the larger project out of which this idea of the thing in itself falls, um, he's engaging in a, a critique of um, of pure reason, but a, a critique sp uh, specifically aimed kind of in, in two directions. On the one hand, against uh, the wild metaphysical speculation uh, that you that is maybe most familiar in the continental rationalists, like say Spinoza, Leibniz, and so on. And on the other hand, he's aiming his critique at the empiricists, who he faults not so much for being wild metaphysical speculators, although they are that too. Uh, but uh, for being skeptics. Um, and he weighs in in the critique of pure reason to try and break through the kind of impasse between these two currents of thinking and to kind of put, put reason in its proper bounds, to allow it to think uh, something substantive, which the skepticism of the empiricist doesn't allow, uh, but to keep it reined in uh, in a way that perhaps the excess of, ra of rationalism uh, doesn't allow. Um, and, uh, to do this, he engages in a reflection about the nature of cognition, right? He, as Hegel likes to talk about it, uh, Kant has us turn and look at the instrument that we use for engaging in, uh, metaphysical thinking and, um, uh, contra the rationalists, he says, we can only have a meaningful thought that kind of captures the real if it is guided and constrained by sensible intuition. You cannot just spin concepts and uh, acquire knowledge of the real. It's gotta be attached to um, and uh, function in tandem with um, sensory perception. In contra, the empiricists, um, mere sensory episodes don't yet either give me cognition of the real um, because through mere sensation, I don't understand what I'm experiencing. Um, so for, for Kant, our cognition has to work as a kind of package deal of sensibility cooperating with concepts. And now here we get closer to the idea of the thing in itself, because what Kant observes about our sensibility is he thinks that our sensibility kind of has a priori forms of space and time, um, but that these a priori forms, that is, are... are uh, kind of intuitive sense of space and time. It's not something that we acquire from experience. It's something that, that our experience kind of comes front loaded with. Um, but uh, it follows then that the forms of space and time are facts about our subjective constitution and that the concepts that have to be reined in by sensation then have to be tailored specifically to that subjective constitution. Uh, and what that means then is that we don't know for sure whether, well, we can't know, uh, whether the way that we understand using our concepts, what shows up in intuition, whether this captures the real as it is in itself or merely appearances. And in fact, I said that uh, a little bit uh, incorrectly. Kant, Kant says quite firmly, uh, we only know appearances, how things appear as we're affected colored by our own uh, mental constitution, not as things might be independent of that, to put it metaphorically, coloring that comes through um, sensibility. So long story short, for Kant, we can know things, we really can have knowledge, he's not a skeptic, but we know about them only through the constraints of our subjective constitution. We know we only know about them as they appear to us. 
And it could be that things are other or different in themselves than as they appear to us. That, that would be my quick rundown. Maybe I'll ask one question and then I'll, I'll let Adam in on the discussion. So, I mean, just from a practical standpoint, there I am, I'm looking at the turkey in my garden or the jar of pickles on the counter or whatever it is. And I know I can grab, I can touch that thing. I can wrap my hands around it. I can feel the heft of either the turkey or the jar of pickles. I can feel the coolness of the jar and what have you. Uh, but there is an aspect to that object which remains inaccessible to me. Um, I can't touch it. Maybe I can know about it, as you indicate in your paper, the, the extent of my knowledge is such that I can posit the, the possibility of there being a thing in itself. But what is it doing for the quote unquote actual object? Like, what is the purpose for, for Kant even positing a thing mm -hmm. in itself? Uh, yeah, so excellent. I think, I think there are a bunch of things to say about that, but maybe the quickest and most straightforward and intuitive one is that for, for Kant, um, so, so I've just said that um, we're constrained to knowing things as they appear to us. Um, the notion of appearance requ requires a kind of like, uh, it's a, a twofold notion. There's the appearance and there's the thing that appears. Uh, and the thing in itself is the thing that appears by way of appearances. Um, and so it's, it's almost like a, it's almost a conceptual truth uh, that, um, that there's got to be a thing on the other side of the appearances that shines through those appearances. Um, so s something has to play that role of the thing other than the appearances that appears through them. That's the thing in itself. Oh, it's interesting to which Kant has to posit this because in, in the framing of the critique of pure reason, it's it's basically um, <clears throat> a war to end all wars because uh, he he starts off talking about dogmatism and essentially that you know, whereas philosophy and theology was supposed to be the queen of the sciences, we're all simply fighting about what things we can derive from various syllogisms, um, nature of God, nature of freedom. You know, this is what Kant's fundamental three questions are: what can I know, what ought I to do, and what can I hope for. And the first critique really is all about, well, mostly about this was one question, what can I, what can I know? And so there's this real sort of split in how he's trying sort of to sort of cap off all of these arguments by saying, you know, it, it, you're all fighting over something that you can't even grasp insofar as any time you think that you've gone further than uh experience you know you've you've gotten out of it you've gone into the speculative realm like plato has into the realm of forms or descartes has when he derives um from the idea that i think he derives a thinking thing a res cogitans another substance out there or where barclay is you know positing that it be, it, all the existence is perception you know he has, a, he has a critique of that in what kant calls the refutation of idealism or leibniz with your monads it's Kant is always going to be saying the same thing. You've taken off from the ground, but you've got nowhere to touch down upon because the ground is always going to be experience. It's going to be sensibility. Now, you know you, you can think the thing in itself, but you can't know it. You can make inferences, but they're going to be what he calls transcendental illusions. And the illusion is going to be that by thinking something, by inferring something merely logically, detach from any kind of grounding in whether or not you can experience it. That is going to be, it, it, it's essentially going to be something you can't, you can never touch down upon. It, it, the idea that your, well, the idea that your ideas, your inferences, uh, using reason, which is a faculty of principles and making inferences and deductions from them, that that constitutes an object rather than gives you a mere thinkable the idea of it, as if you know by. So this you know, this goes to his famous critique of the ontological argument basically that God exists by definition, that therefore the logical inference of, uh, of, of identity therefore constitutes the thing that it identifies. No, he's going to say these are all regulative. And there's, and there's a split, really. And in, in your paper, Matt, you bring this up, sort of between how we read this concept of the thing in itself, which is sometimes called the noumena, but then again, you know, it's a question of, is this simply a limit condition on what investigations we're meant to be conducting because Kant thinks this is the ground of you know metaphysics of nature. He calls you know, the, the, you know he says these phrases and he calls a uh, the proud name of an ontology is now limited by the critique of pure reason. Or when he says a phrase like you know the conditions of the possibility of experience are the same as the conditions of possibility of the object of experience. We're all just swimming in a sea of possible experience. It is it is 
the question of is this numinal thing a limit condition, simply a, you know, a regulative thing saying stay away from this area because you're never going to get anything, or is it as Henry Allison points out, and as you point out, Matt, that Husserl might be closer to in this regard, positing a, a two worlds theory that there is a world that is for us and the world is in itself. And there are these two worlds constituted by this division, and yet we can only think one. Because you know, if you want to sum up Kant in a sentence, we can only receive things in a way receivable to our capacity to receive them. Maybe one more thing that we can uh, talk about with respect to Kant before moving on to Husserl is, um, I, I want to perhaps shore up an argument for Kant. And maybe you can tell me from the vantage point of, of, of me and my explanation of it or my understanding of the thing in myself, maybe what's right and what's wrong with respect to Kant's idea of the thing in itself. I mean, just me and my ordinary, everyday perception of the world, I'm picking up my cat, I'm picking books off the bookshelf, I'm, I'm seeing this, I'm seeing that, all of which comprise you know, what we may call sense data, experience things which devolve upon you know my capacity to sense or, or perceive things in the world and no matter at what level i dig down into the realm of experience like if i look at the the microbial level or if i look at the the realm of quanta for example um, I can see things, I can use a microscope, I can use nanotechnology or, or what have you to, to see things that aren't ordinarily available to me. But even if I see at, at a more intense level, I'm still relying upon this apparatus of perception that um, you know, my ordinary experience leans upon. And so there, there's a way in which I can never really get to the conditions of the experience. So in a sense, isn't Kant right? Like there is an element to our, our, not only our perception of the world, but just our mere existence in the world where there's a realm of no access or incomplete access, maybe to be a little bit more liberal about it, um, because I can posit it conceptually and therefore know it. Um, wh why isn't Kant right about that? <laughs> I mean, for my part, I think that um, that despite the disagreements that I'm going to lay out, so first of all, speaking for Husserl, um, the disagreements between Husserl and Kant, there is an underlying affinity that even in his disagreement with Kant, Husserl does want to do justice to the finitude of experience. Um, and, and that's going to be like his way of doing that is going to be what I end up pressing on as being problematic in the same way as, as it was for Kant. And so for me, then this just becomes a question. I'm not sure what to say. I think you're right. I think that somehow the finitude of, of what we can know and what we can come into con what we can understand and what we can, you know, immediately come into contact with. Um, I think that that does in some important way, shape and structure our experience. I'm, I'm not sure how, uh, but I, I think, uh, any approach that leads to the results that um, that Husserl's does, I'm I'm a little bit more optimistic about Kant, honestly, um, is uh, is problematic and uh, beyond beyond salvaging in the way that he wants to spell it out. So, how then does Husserl understand the thing in itself, and what are some conceptual developments that he makes um, that are a departure from Kant? Yeah, so Husserl's approach to the thing in itself, um, uh, that comes out of his analysis of perceptual experience. And he has a way that he likes to characterize perceptual experience that emerges already in the early work of the logical investigations, which is 1900, 1901, and the second, or sorry, the, the second volume uh, of the logical investigations in particular where he comes to characterize perceptual experience as inadequate. This is like a technical notion for him, uh, adequacy versus inadequacy. And adequacy versus inadequacy um, are not unique to perception. They're characteristics of any kind of intuitive experience. Um, and what I see is that Husserl's attempt to do justice to the finitude of experience and to... Um, to show us how we access reality as it is in itself 
um, which he thinks that we can, uh, we, we can know reality as it is in itself and its intrinsic properties, who Searle thinks. Um, the notion of, of adequacy and inadequacy play a huge role here. And basically, um, you can think about it like this. Um, there's kind of the familiar example that tends to get trotted out when you talk about Husserl and his account of intentionality. Um, imagine you're looking at a box. Uh, uh, it's cuban, cuboid, cubish in shape. You're perceiving the box and you recognize it perceptually. In your experience, before you take a moment to think and reflect and to apply a concept, you recognize perceptually that you're looking at a cube. Um, your shape, or sorry, the shape of the item uh, comes across in your perceptual experience. Um, now, the catch is this. If we try to kind of zoom in on your experience and describe what's available to you, in a way, it seems like the cube is not available. Only at most one to three sides of it are available. So we're, we're, we face a dilemma here. Either we have to say, you don't really see the cube, or, and this is the route that Husserl thinks, you, we do see the cube, but what we see stretches beyond what immediately falls into view. We have an intuitive exposure to the one to three sides of the cube. And in addition to that, we have a non-intuitive, empty understanding of the remaining sides. Okay, now bringing it back to the idea of adequacy versus inadequacy, an experience is adequate if the meaning that it has, for instance, my understanding that I'm perceiving a cube, if the meaning of the experience perfectly matches what's intuitively given. In the cube experience, this is not the case. And in fact, in principle, can't be the case. Um, I cannot, in an intuitive experience, take in all of the sides of the cube. I'm constrained always to perceiving one to three and then emptily in a non-intuitive way, experiencing uh, the remaining sides. Um, so Husserl does think that we experience the cube. He's not skeptical due to the fact that I can only see it partially. He thinks this is, this is the, our, our condition uh, in that of any being that has to approach things through intuition. And he thinks that's the only option. There's no non-intuitive way of, of coming to know things that we're going to be constrained in this kind of way. Um, and he tries to, to kind of put a positive spin on, um, on how it works. Um, so for Husserl, the thing in itself is not at all problematic. He doesn't think that, uh, he doesn't see it exactly as a limit to knowledge. He thinks that when I see the shape of the thing, I genuinely come to know the shape of the thing. And there's not another way the thing is besides that shape. It's got other properties, but whatever those are, I can experience those too immediately and directly. Um, and there's no sense in which the thing or the properties that it has that I experience um, is not available to me in perception. It's not available all at once because perception's inadequate, but through the course of experience, I can take in what at the moment is not available to me. The way that you explain that actually quite reminds me of analytic philosopher G.E. Moore talking about sense data. Um, I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with the paper that I'm talking about where he talks about viewing all sides. Not I, Is it the hands paper? Oh, yeah, it is the hands paper, I believe. Um, but the, where he talks about viewing the sides of, of a white paper. Uh, I think part of the problematic, as I understand it in G.E. Moore's argument that I would then interrogate in Husserl's argument is, where do concepts lie? Of course, we are getting this sense data from somewhere. You know, does it inhere within the paper that I see somewhere in the exterior world, or does it rest upon something happening in my brain or within the act of mentation itself? Or do we need, con do concepts come from the outside? Yeah, that's a, that is a very tricky question. Um, so, so I was just talking about um, experience having a sense in explaining the idea of adequacy versus um, inadequacy. It's all about the intuitive presentation of a thing, measuring up to the sense of a thing. Um, so Husserl thinks that meaning is a constitutive feature of experience. And um, often, at least in analytic philosophy of language, when you talk about, uh, and this goes at least back to, uh, to Frege, when Frege talked about meaning, he used the German word Sinn, which means sense. It's the same word that Husserl uses to talk about it. Um, and concepts, in, Frege, in the Fregean vernacular are senses. 
Um, so many, many scholars have observed this affinity between Husserl and analytic philosophy. Um, there's a, a raging and probably never ending debate about whether the sense that's at work in perception is conceptual. Um, uh, I'm inclined to think that uh, it is, or the notion of sense falls apart, and I'm not sure what, uh, what the sense of sense is. Um, but um, uh, there are concepts involved, or there, there's at least a sense involved. Maybe we want to distinguish the sense of perception and the sense of, of language. Lots of phenomenologists like to do this. Um, and, and call them like varieties of meaning. Um, but then, then your further question, like where is where does the sense lie? Is it in my head? Is it the thing? Is it between me and the thing? Is it like Frege said in, in a third realm beyond space and time or distinct from space and time? Uh, Husserl's attitude on this changes. In the logical investigations, he thinks that, so the 1900-1901 work, Husserl thinks that um, uh, meanings are like um, ab abstract objects. They're like um, uh, pl kind of platonic entities, kind of like I was describing uh, the mentioning anyway, the Fregan, Fregan idea of a third realm. They're, they're not bound by space and time. They can be instanced in space and time, but they're instanced in my act of perceiving the thing. Um, but uh, but uh, the meaning itself is like a universal. Later on, he shifts gears in this is like the 1913 work ideas one um where he, he comes out as a transcendental philosopher a transcendental idealist even um and in that work he shifts his account of how he understands sense and meaning um he still thinks of them as being kind of like an abstract object and they're in they're essentially associated with acts of experiencing and thinking but you'll also find him saying that, so in, in the, uh, in Ideas 1, he introduces the idea of the noema. And the noema is a complex idea, but one of the central, com central um, components of the noema is what he calls the noematic sense. And, he, and Husserl thinks that this is not a mental entity. Um, it is essentially connected to my act but it's not created by my act of experience and it's not, it's not literally a constituent part of uh, my act of experience. Um, some interpreters uh, actually come to think that for Husserl, the noematic sense, the meaning um, is identical to the thing. Uh, and, and they think that there's, there's kind of a, they, they have a kind of two aspect reading of things. There are things naively approached where we don't recognize the meaning. And there are things approached phenomenologically where through this special phenomenological reduction and epoche, that sort of thing, we come to, uh, describe the meanings, but the meanings are in a way identical to the things, uh, going back to your original question, where are they? See, I'm starting to recall some of my old Husserl training. My my question then would be, well, then how does that not beg the question? I mean, you're just essentially creating a concept that creates an equivalence between the meaning and the object. And uh, I think I think that here, and uh, I'm on board with you. That like that's exactly what I would say. If we want to if we want to locate the the sense or the concept or the meaning, however we want to characterize it, if we locate that as in some sense, identical to the thing, there's the question, how, how do I link up to it? Um, isn't that is like for, for many people who, uh, who try and grapple with the idea of meaning, the function of meaning is precisely to connect me to the thing. So then if I like shove the meaning on over and I equate it with the thing, like, how do I link up with it? Um, and I think, I think Husserl has the resources to deal with this. Um, it maybe has some awkward metaphysical implications um, or some opens up some very big uh, questions. But he's got this idea of Zingebung or sense bestowal that in, in some sense, my ability to link up with things comes out of my act and my ability to give or bestow a sense. Now, the awkward question then is if sense is in some sense identical to the thing, like what does it mean that I'm bestowing the sense on the thing? If at the same time, according to Husserl, I'm not creating the thing. He's not a Barclay and he's not a subjective idealist. Uh, and I don't have any answers. I don't have answers to these questions. Uh, but the, the problem that you indicate, I think, like he, 
he's attempting to solve it through the idea of sense bestowal. I don't want to bogart the whole conversation. So Adam, go for it. Yeah, it's just interesting how it's, this is a problem that keeps reappearing throughout the history of the philosophy of you know, experience, particularly in the transcendental mode in which we're thinking about the conditions of possibility of experience. Because it's, I mean, so Schelling does the same thing, you know, in the, a similar move in the sense in which, you know, you try to posit something with metaphysical, physical implication that connects the conditions of the possibility of experience to the event, to the actual activity of, a, of sensation. And it's, so, yeah, for Schelling, you know, it's, it's nature. The, 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 he does what he calls Spinozism of physics. He finds the conditions of possibility of the conditions of possibility, and that's in nature. For Kant, it ends up going... I mean, we did this years ago in our Opus Postum episode, where essentially the, the conditions of possibility themselves become like a, a fluidic substance that he calls either ether or caloric, which are basically intense heat fluid. Which um, and there are ripples in that, and when it ripples back upon itself, that's what experience is. We are ripples in this, and it's, it seems like there's some really strong metaphysical implications here, especially in terms of, I guess, what I've heard before described as sort of like one of the slogans, I guess you could say, of Husserlian phenomenology, which is you know back to the things themselves, which is for a Kantian is like, well, no, no, we, we've been going back. We never, we never got there in the first place. I mean, is 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 there a kind of a metaphysics of, I guess. We could loosely call, and you know, passing over to analytics, common sense operative in in Husserl, and does that presuppose any kind of anthropological investigation in the similar way that Kant is looking at humans specifically and the human faculties that they have, which of course took him to some incredibly dark places, as Robert Bernasconi's investigations into Kant and the origins of, of the concept of race. Mm, yeah. I think like Husserl definitely does not want to follow Kat, Kant down that path. And he gives Kant a lot of heat for um, uh, like, he, he thinks that Kant is guilty of a transcendental psychologism. So psychologism, this is one of the ideas that Husserl kind of comes out swinging uh, in logical investigations against, uh, is kind of reduces logic to um, our actual patterns of thinking. Um, whereas Husserl wants to say, no, like logic has some kind of objectivity of it, whether we think a thought or not, uh, its, val its validity doesn't depend on that. Um, uh, and uh, very much Husserl uh, develops his view against Kant, uh, because for Kant too, not only um, are my forms of sensibility contingent features of my constitution and other beings might have different forms of intuition, or I don't know, um, or, or simply not have uh, forms of intuition like a divine intellect, um, but the categories are developed, are adapted specifically to our form of intuition. So the, the categories don't characterize things as they are in themselves. We can't apply them straight away, except by intuition. Um, so for all we know, the forms of, right, this, this is, this is again, coming back to the core problem that uh, um, uh, our discussion is revolving around the thing in itself, is that Husserl wants to be able to uh, say that whatever kind of forms of intuition or whatever categories or concepts or senses or meanings that they place that they apply straightforwardly to things and that our investigation into knowing them is not looking into us and our subjective constitution. Um, so this is an interesting point where Kant says we can only know appearances. We can't know the thing in itself. He says, ah, but you know, there could be a divine intellect, uh, that wasn't constrained by sensibility and the forms of intuition, and it could cognize um, uh, things as they are in themselves directly. And Husserl has a really interesting move. He says it's not just because of our our um, our subjective constitution that uh, that reality appears the way that it does. Any being would be would face the same constraints as we would. Um, even a, even a divine being would have to uh, proceed through intuition perspectively. Even a divine being looking at the cube would only see its one to three sides uh, and, and have this inadequacy to its experience. Um, inter an interesting split uh, between, between Husserl and Kant on exactly that point, Adam. 
Yeah, Husserl versus Kant. I mean, that's also that's also taking pot shots of Wittgenstein as well. You know, they for lying, speak English, we could not understand him. This is that's truly like very like strong universalism. There. And that, that's that's really interesting. It also feels it doesn't feel pre, it's not it's definitely not pre-critical, but it's definitely reaching back in a similar way to I guess Schelling as well into those kind of more classical sort of Greek universal kind of theories of metaphysics. I mean, to that extent, then, so the transcendental is is not just a transcendental for us in a way, because the transcendental for Kant, we only know them as they are for us. That means he, he's he's universalizing the transcendental. It's a transcendent, in a way, is it we can go back to the things themselves, because he's going further than Kant and says, yeah, I'm doing transcendental idealism, but we're not getting the transcendental for us. We're getting the transcendental in yeah. itself. Is that the leap? Yeah. yeah. And, and really, like, Husserl does want to... It, and there are a lot of ways in which, as, as opposed to Kant, as I've, I've just characterized him, and I, and I have earlier uh, in our conversation too, there is this real deep affinity. Like the starting point um, of our discussion about this, I was laying out Kant's project of in relation to the empiricists and the rationalists. The empiricists wanted to go just through sensibility, to, and they ended up with skepticism. The rationalists wanted to uh, approach the real just by a concepts and they ended up in wild speculation. Kant said, no, we need to bring these two things together and that's going to rein in metaphysical speculation. Husserl agrees completely only for Husserl. Um, it's not our discursive concepts that rein in uh, immediately and uh, for the most part that rein in um, uh, our, uh, our knowledge of the real. Uh, it's the sense that operates on an intuitive level that uh, that reigns things in. So Husserl would, in a way, sign off completely on Kant's famous remark, uh, intuitions without uh, concepts are blind and concepts without intuitions are empty. Uh, Husserl would agree with that with some modification that uh, intuition without sense is uh, blind and sense without intuition is empty. And these two things have to kind of coordinate in the right way. Uh, for us to have any kind of cognition and knowledge. Maybe to talk about Husserl a little bit more, we'll start with an example. I'll set up a situation, and I, I'd like to confront Husserl's notion of adequacy as this, this sort of modification of uh, the way that we could perhaps know the thing in itself. So there's this jar of pickles on my counter. Yet again, I turn my head for a moment, and my wife sneaks it away. And at that very same moment, she triggers uh, a holographic illusion of that jar of pickles, or she activates the Neuralink that I didn't know was implanted a, a week or so prior. And suddenly there, a program has been run now where I see a jar of pickles on, on that counter that looks exactly like the one that she took away. Um, I think you know, our intuition about this is the jar of pickles that was taken away and what I'm now, quote unquote, seeing on the counter, um, whether it's with my eyes or by dint of having, you know, some sort of brain function activated synthetically, um, th they're very different things. And so it seems as if the notion of adequacy could easily fall apart. What, what, how would Husserl confront this example? So this is a good one, and uh, I've actually written a couple papers exactly on the topic of Husserl and his account of hallucination. Uh, there, this is this is uh, there are a whole bunch of views that Husserl scholars have tried to spin out of Husserl's texts on this. So anything that I say is going to be like idiosyncratic to my point of view. Um, but I, I think that actually Husserl's notion of inadequacy is designed exactly to deal with the kind of case that you're describing as because the notion of inadequacy is how he explains the finitude and the limitation of our cognition. He thinks that because my perception is inadequate, any knowledge I get from it is essentially um, what he calls presumptive. It can be overridden. It can be corrected. There's, although he says you experience the really real, um, you're still fallible and it can turn out that you were mistaken. Uh, but in the further correction, you find access to the really real. And, and there's always the possibility of that getting uh, upset and uh, uh, overturned. But um, uh, 
the um, this this also is connected to kind of the the core of Husserl's project in Ideas One of developing a transcendental philosophy that um, I experience um, things other than myself, worldly things, material things, the jar of pickles, uh, etc. Um, I experience those inadequately. My own consciousness, I experience it adequately. And in Ideas One, Husserl famously draws a metaphysical consequence from this, that these different modes of experience are indicating different modes of being, that consciousness is an essentially different thing than the things that are experienced by way of consciousness. And that the things that I can experience adequately have a kind of absolute existence, and I can have an absolute unqualified knowledge of them. Whereas the things beyond my consciousness that I experience inadequately in perception and other modes of experience, um, those, um, not only is my knowledge of them fallible, their being is kind of contingent in a way that my own and my consciousness um, isn't. This is uh, kind of one of the most decisive points that Husserl makes, and it, it makes lots of Husserlians uncomfortable uh, uh, that uh, they often don't want to follow him in, in this path of, of creating this radical categorical split between conscious consciousness and the world, understandably in the wake of, of Heideggerianism and, and subsequent phenomenology and the emphasis on the essential connectedness of mind and world. Husserl's appears at least vastly out of step with that. It almost introduces a kind of Nietzschean or Klosowskian sort of problem to say how consciousness is composed and can consciousness ever access those determinants which inform it. Um, but we'll leave that aside for now. Uh, <laughs> I guess uh, the the thing that I want to know about, you know, looking at the what I guess we would call the conclusion of your paper, is, and and I want to put this in in a way that's just easy to understand for everybody who's listening. So maybe I'll just return to an example yet again. Um, so thinking about Husserl and the notion of adequacy elevated to the idea of like a regulative principle. So it, it seems almost, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's almost like if if we cannot determine the adequacy or if we cannot ground the adequacy of regulative principle, it almost seems like what we're confronting in your paper is um, it's almost like Husserl is trying to make induction a little bit more ironclad. And without that, we return to a Humean problem where, you know, really our experience of the world, the notion of even causality itself, for example, cannot be given a strong ground outside of anything we experience. To me, that seems kind of the upshot, or at least that's the kind of eddy or cul-de-sac it puts us back into. How would you respond to that? Um, so I, I like your question, and uh, and the reference to induction is really interesting in this context, because I think Husserl... Um, well, I, I know who Searle thinks that induction is grounded in this very structure of ina the inadequacy of uh, of experience. So, like, it, I, I got to, like, do a couple steps of spelling out who Searle's thinking here. Um, so who Searle thinks that I experience things inadequately in the way that I had mentioned earlier. Right? I can only see the facing side of the box, not the reverse side. But um, one point that I didn't yet bring out is that for who Searle, even the sides of the box that are in view, even those I experience inadequately. Um, even the sense of the facing surface of the box does not measure up to the sense of it because he thinks I can always have a more precise experience of that facing surface. I can get a little closer and get a little closer and take in a little bit more um, of what it is that wasn't given immediately. And he thinks there's no limit to that. Um, that's where my kind of critique in the paper comes out of, uh, because my complaint is if it's the case that even the facing side of the object is experienced inadequately, then in what sense am I really experiencing it? In one sense, is there really fulfillment um, if what I'm immediately and directly presented with never measures up? with the sense of my experience, not even in the tiniest moment. And, and this is not me overplaying it. Husserl says this emphatically, 
that perceptual experience is radically inadequate. Now, to get to the point about induction, um, Husserl's kind of attempt to get out of this is to say, um, because he recognizes the difficulty that I'm pressing him on, is to say, well, it's true. I can never have in one go an absolute experience of the thing where its intuitive presentation fully satisfies the meaning, the understanding that I bring to it, um, the sense of uh, the experience. Um, it's radically inadequate even. However, there emerges in the course of experience, like you were mentioning, a kind of regulative ideal. Um, as I continue experiencing the thing from various points of view, although I can't take it all in in one go, uh, a kind of rule emerges and I become, it, through reflection, I can become conscious of what that rule is. And that rule prescribes the course of experience that I would have to follow to have perfect, adequate knowledge of the thing. Ordinarily, we're not conscious of this, we're not aware of it, but behind the scenes, this kind of regulative principle is guiding us in the course of our experience, indicating you don't have the full picture of the thing yet, but if you keep going, you can experience more of it in increasingly per uh, perfect um, uh, approximations of inadequacy. Uh, the thing about the rule though for, for Husserl is that uh, it prescribes an infinite series, an endless open series of appearances um, where the perf perfect, perfectly adequate uh, perception is never actualized in this process. So it's this consciousness of the rule governing the ongoing course of my experience. This is kind of the ground of induction for him that we're always doing induction implicitly, even in our perceiving whether we think and draw any inferences or not, by operating according with this rule that tells me, ah, you've experienced so much, and you've experienced so much more in determinacy that confirmed what you initially experienced and amplified it, and that kept happening, um, that these further confirmations kind of solidify the path that you're on and confirm the rule that's guiding your underlying experience. And it only gets more and more confirmed and uh, consolidated as, or not consolidated, but validated um, as uh, experience goes on. Now, but again, I want to qualify that like um, uh, by saying that for Husserl, it's important that that rule is always presumptive. It can get overturned. It could be that I'm wrong. It could be like the scenario that you described earlier that I'm like in some kind of hologram scenario and I've got to start over. But even in that case, I start from scratch. I've got new experiences. A new rule emerges out of it. And I act and think and perceive according to that rule. I think we're edging up against one of the challenges that I have with phenomenology broadly construed, and maybe this even comes from my Deleuzian commitment somewhat, but I'll try to keep it simple for the sake of the conversation, which is, is there an aspect to which maybe not just Husserl, but phenomenologists in general, um, when we're talking about things like perfect adequacy, the complete object. Is there a way in which the notion of completeness or perfection presupposes itself in a way that stems thinking about things perhaps in a more associative sort of way, or thinking not in terms of completeness or object fit, but resonance and, and what have you? Because I, I see that there could actually be some pretty strong political implications for this you know, as, as it would to escalate into various orders of thinking. Yeah, I think, I think this speaks to the underlying rationalism of Husserl's thinking, uh, which he shares in common with all the way back to Kant and, uh, and prior to, um, that it's his rationalist commitments that, that have him fixated on adequacy and a kind of, uh, uh, an overall philosophical perspective that's oriented by cognition. I think maybe that's sort of where you're pressing. Maybe, maybe not. Um, perhaps a, a different way to think about it is that I, I think maybe what you're gesturing at is that uh, there could be different norms of cognition and that Husserl's norm of cognition is something about completeness, but we might perhaps in fact or otherwise operate according to a different kind of norm of resonance or something like that. Um, which I was about to say that has a different goal, but I'm guessing that it wouldn't even be teleological uh, uh, 
Um, and I kind of threw it out there. Like it was just a word that seemed to, to function like in opposition, perhaps to fit. Yeah. yeah. There, interestingly, Husserl's story is complex. So the ultimate governing norm is going to be a cognitive one of rationality and completeness, but you'll find along the way, all sorts of other norms of coherence and, connect and connectedness that are non-conceptual and non-cognitive in nature, maybe most fundamentally our experience of time. Um, so, so there are, there are elements of his phenomenological project where he, he accommodates the sorts of things that you speak of, but they're always going to have a, uh, however important they are, a kind of secondary, uh, function and, and importance to him. It's, there's a, an additional term just in the work related in the work, the paper you sent us, Matt, in relation to inadequacy, which I just wanted to hammer on a bit to actually just clarify just this sense of counter sense well i'm guessing i want i'm wondering what german is it like gegen sense and like sense against sense or is it or is it like vida 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 sin like uh like count literally like contra sense i mean it, you know so if in in a so you know, where is nonsense here you know is is, is there a if in spot we is 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 nonsense in a sort of way a a primary category of the trans is, is that replaced transcendental hallucination or sorry, transcendental illusions. It was in someone like Kant because for Kant, I mean, I, mean, I always find it interesting things to German comrades when they say that I remember once a friend said, there's an interesting phrase in English, which is, you know, uh, it makes sense. It doesn't quite make sense to say, you know, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's max sin. You know, it's, it's, you could say like a SS is a zinvol, you know, it's meaningful. It's full of sense. And there's, I mean, may, maybe maybe there, there's a sort of analytic critique there of, which would be ironic coming from the analytics to some extent, of, you know, there's a linguistic, the substance here of sense is, 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 is probably from a German linguistic category here. But my dream that's, yeah, that's really hanging for me is, is where is where is nonsense and countersense and how do these two things interact? Yeah. So for, so Husserl distinguishes, um, so this comes out of the logical investigations. Um, uh, but it's it's a theme that he sticks with and finds interesting use of way up until right, so logical investigations in 1900, 1901, um, all, all the way up until formal and transcendental logic, which, shoot, don't quote me on this, but I want to say 1929, but that's probably wrong, around then. Um, he gives, uh, he, he carries on this idea of um, talking about nonsense and dis distinguishing nonsense from counter sense. So nonsense for Husserl would be um, uh, what appears to be a thought uh, due to a combination of words that is technically grammatically correct. Oh, no, no, sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, non nonsense emerges when you have a string of words that isn't even grammatically uh, coherent. So if you were to just throw a bunch of words together uh, and say it was a thought, uh, this, this yet wouldn't count as a thought. Countersense is something different. Countersense Husserl actually says does express a thought, um, but it's a kind of uh, it's a kind of limit thought. Uh, it's a thought that has to be rejected uh, and that can't be a part of our theoretical uh, discourse. It marks kind of the, the the limit of our theoretical discourse. That's why he thinks that um, Kant's idea of a thing in itself is countersensical. Um, and this is a limit that we have to leave behind. It's countersensical because for Husserl, the very idea of a thing is something that can be experienced, but Kant has the thing in itself as something that is not accessible to experience. And a countersense for Husserl is when you try and combine two thoughts that cannot be thought together. You try and put them under the umbrella of a single thought. So like a classic example is like round square. Um, Husserl says, you do think something. There is a whole thought when you think round square. Um, but there's nothing that you can do with that thought because you can't bring it to intuition. You can't then go seek out an experience. It's inconceivable, an item that will satisfy both of those descriptions because they kind of repel each other. And Husserl says, that's what's going on with Kant and the thing in itself too. Uh, it's supposed to be a thing which by nature can be experienced uh, but it's in itselfness is supposed to be its inherent separability from experience. Husserl says that's like round square. These ideas cannot go together. Um, and so he rejects it. Um, uh, 
so what's the function of nonsense for Husserl? Um, it's for engaging in philosophical critique, marking off the, the boundaries of what we can work with in thinking and what we have to avoid. But um, it doesn't have a positive function. So he's he doesn't follow Kant into the antinomies uh, of thinking that there's a positive function of contradiction. He doesn't follow Hegel uh, and Kier Kierkegaard and all of these other thinkers, even Merleau-Ponty after him. Uh, is Hegelian enough to think that, uh, that that contradiction and nonsense has has a kind of positive function? Husserl is too rationalist for that. Maybe one more question as we aim towards wrapping up this uh, phenomenal conversation. But um, do you think there is a future? for the research of the thing in itself? Are there any promising avenues or approaches within the realm of phenomenology? Or maybe another question is, uh, have we gone beyond that? Like what, what, what is the current horizon of new problematics in the world of phenomenology? Yeah, I think it's still, uh, it still remains a pressing problem. So in the, in the paper that uh, I had you guys look at, that our discussions revolving around, I actually open it up with a reference to Lukács, Georg Lukács. And uh, in History and Class Consciousness, he has this idea that the thing in itself is not just a problem for Kant, but it's a problem that afflicts thinking in our era or bourgeois thinking. Um, inherently, that there's no escaping it. And then if you look at all the attempts to try and run away from Kant and overcome what people thought was prob problematic about the thing in itself, they just shift around and relocate the problem. Uh, it's disguised, masked, and uh, swept under the rug. But it's always lurking there. Um, now, I don't know if I would follow Lukács in, exactly in saying that, but I, I think there's something to what he's saying, that... It remains an open question, um, uh, and an interesting question to explore um, when we know the real, and for Husserl in particular, when we like come into immediate direct contact with the real, um, do we experience it as it really is? Are there limits? Is there a beyond? Um, maybe, maybe the continuing relevance of the question is that until we have a, 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 an adequate uh, to use the word in a different way, uh, until we have an adequate conception of finitude, um, we're going to be plagued with the problem of the thing in itself. Um, now, I, like, I can recognize that from other philosophical perspectives, uh, perhaps uh, like so from the perspective that says, oh, well, you just shouldn't be operating with norms of uh, adequacy and completeness in the first place. Well, then this will all look like a fake problem. Um, I'm, I'm rationalist enough and I'm with Husserl. I think his successors, um, uh, like Heidegger, um, uh, would want to conceive finitude without the norm of adequacy and completeness. He absolutely would. Um, so there's a path in phenomenology that follows it a different direction than Husserl's a non-rationalist path. But if you follow Husserl and, um, uh, and Sartre and Merleau-Ponty, um, and that kind of thinking, which I, I still think is promising, then um, then yeah, you you owe some account of finitude, you owe some account of um, uh, whether our understanding measures up to things or not. Adam, anything uh, final before we finish up? No, I think it's it's just particularly pertinent to question. Yeah, just to bring in the. The, the the question of affinity, particularly as it's it, I mean going back to Kant, you keep going back to Kant. It's, 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 it's just it's this constant tension of the imagination in relation to perception. Because I mean, Schelling brings up as well the idea that things feel like they could go on infinitely. We're constantly pursuing these these uh, these impulses to go beyond experience, beyond finitude, because by virtue of the imagination, you know that that we could we could have got ages of imagination, but imagination is kind of the the one weird trick Kant brings the style altogether. And it's what allows them to bypass all of these metaphysics of sense and these mechanisms of induction and connection that her cells bring, bring forward here. So I think, you know, if, if one wanted to, to go into the, the science of phenomenology in, in a way, what her cell, I just think what's sort of admirable about her cells projects, he's bypassing the very easy positing of certain, what was it called to Kant, the, the dark art of the soul that the imagination does for him. 
it really gives us a chance to give the first the first ever logic of sense and you can really see that from the legacy you know not not even just you know heidegger you know the, the, the bastard who betrayed him to the to the fascists but of course merlo ponty you know existentialism you know this is he's a i mean even on our side he's a really underrated uh thinker and i want to you know, thanks again matt for coming to talk of it talk to us about him today is there anything that you want to plug on the show today, Matt? Of course, we're going to put your Twitter handle in the in the show notes so that everybody can access the steady flow of memes that come out of there. But do you have any books in the works or anything else? Uh, I so I um, I'm I'm hoping that uh, that the material that we've been talking about will see the light of day in publication. It's still under review. Um, I am doing some work uh, on Husserl. Now, um, uh, trying to link his idea of genetic phenomenology um, to some recent discussions in uh, psychology, cognitive science, and philosophy of perception about, and this is really just in the last five to 10 years that this has taken off, at least in, philo- in, the, in the world of philosophy, um, the um, idea of perceptual learning that, uh, that per- our, our perceptual experience is kind of plastic and fluid and that um, so there's maybe a kind of implicit dogma that a lot of people have had about perceptual experience that like in perception, like in vision, you take in like um, colors, shapes, motion, distance, uh, stuff like that size, but like that's the limit. And there's, there's nothing you ever learn. Like you can see new and different shapes and things at various distances, but you, you never really learn in perception. Learning happens at the domain of cognition. Well, Husserl and his genetic phenomenology suggests that there's a continuing flux of this and development of the sense of perceptual experience. And we perceive more than just these types of low level properties I was describing, um, but that you recognize trees and like you can recognize all sorts of categories of things and that we learn to do this. Um, and uh Interesting work has been coming out uh, in psychology for decades, confirming this idea that perceptual experience is malleable and plastic. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm finding a way to try and put these two uh, areas of research in conversation, see, see what Husserl's phenomenological methodology has to, has to uh, add to this discussion. Because people always give lip service. They say, introspectively, it seems one way or another in this talk about um, uh, perceptual learning, but uh, most of the action for them typically takes place in psychological and neuroscientific research, um, and the, the the aspect of consciousness is kind of minimal. So I'm wondering if there's something more interesting going on there. And what and what initially sent me down this road was something far different from what I've just been describing, uh, but it was um, reading Marcuse in uh, Eros and Civilization and his discussion of. Uh, the liberation of the senses uh, or the emancipation of the senses that Marx talks about that uh, in the in the kind of revolution that Marcuse anticipates it's a shift not just in our frame of mind but even in our way of experiencing even in the architectonic of reason that our understanding comes to be subordinate to the flexibility of our uh, of our perception I'm not I'm not yet at the point where I can connect those dots to this stuff in Husserl, but uh, you know, a guy can dream. Well, that topic sounds more familiar to the general Asset Horizon Fair. And so if you ever want to come back and talk about that, be our guest. I know Will wants you to come back and talk a uh, Heidegger question concerning technology or something sometime yeah, yeah. if you're willing, but um, it was great to meet you in the digital flesh here as the hologram for the very first time. And we hope to connect with you again, not only here, but also on the timeline. Awesome. Pleasure talking with you, Adam. Pleasure talking with you, Craig. All right.